From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is David Feldman, along with the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Steve Scrovan is on assignment. He's taking a vacation. Sounds better. Hi, Ralph. Hi. On today's show, our themes are water and power. Our first guest will be George Hawkins, head of DC Water, which is a not-for-profit municipal water utility serving the District of Columbia. It's known for being innovative, environmentally focused, and rate payer funded. It's a model for the rest of our country. This is particularly relevant in light of the wastewater treatment issues caused by the recent hurricanes Harvey and Irma and Maria. That's the water portion of the show. For the power portion, we're going to speak with media maven Douglas Rushkoff, who has written numerous books on media in the digital age, including Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, How Growth Became the Enemy of Prosperity. But first, George Hawkins serves as chief executive officer and general manager of DC Water, which is a public utility that distributes drinking water and collects and treats wastewater for more than 672,000 residents and nearly 18 million annual visitors to the District of Columbia. DC Water also provides wholesale wastewater treatment services for 1.6 million people in Montgomery and Prince George's counties in Maryland and Fairfax and Loudoun counties in Virginia. They provide high quality water services in a safe, environmentally friendly and efficient manner. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, George Hawkins. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. It's quite an honor to be here. Indeed, welcome, Mr. Hawkins. As one of the lead advocates for the Drinking Water Safety Act of 1974, which has been amended in a major way twice since then, I want to tell our listeners that this program will relate to your drinking water problems and drinking water challenges and safety back home, where you are. We've heard enough in recent years, most poignantly the lead contamination at Flint, Michigan, to warrant a much more incisive focus by citizen groups, not just environmental groups, mothers, fathers, city officials into the state of drinking water, where they are, and exactly what rights they have to get information periodically from their drinking water institution and their community under the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act of 1974. So let's start with something very contemporary, Mr. Hawkins. And I must say that George Hawkins, in my book, is the leading administrator in the country of drinking water service. And he's been at it since 2009. He has innovated outreach to communities. He and his people actually go to neighborhoods and talk about what's on people's mind, advise them about how things are going, what improvements can be made. And it's a model for the rest of the country. So let's start with the damage from Hurricanes Harvey and Irma, and who knows what other hurricanes are on the way and the wastewater treatment plants in Florida and Texas, and how they've been compromised and what should have or could be done. It's a great question, and thank you for the kind words, Mr. Nader. I'm grateful for what the team here has been able to do, although I always tend to think of all the things we need to do better, and there's still a lot more to be done here and a lot of places where we'd like to get better than where we are. But it's been a challenge to watch, obviously, what has transpired in Texas and Louisiana and Georgia and Florida. And it's something that we're very mindful of here. The only reason that those circumstances haven't happened here in Washington, D.C., with a storm coming up at Potomac is just luck or, or fortune. There will come a time when a storm of that size and scale will take the turn and come up and hit us straight on. We need to be thinking about what we're going to do and how we're going to plan for and prepare, not just to try to manage the storm when it hits, but also manage the aftermath of the storm and how we are resilient to get our services back on place. It's really risky for a treatment plant on either side, drinking water or wastewater. We tend not to call it wastewater. We call it enriched water because we like the idea of turning it back into a resource in other fashions. But there's all sorts of challenges if 
the water bodies that we're near. And of course, our facilities are right next to water bodies. Drinking water plant has got to be close by where the water is coming from. In our case, our biggest drinking water treatment facility is right next to and near the Potomac. That's the source of our drinking water in Washington, D.C. and for a lot of the region. And our big treatment facility, Blue Plains, which is the largest advanced wastewater treatment plant on Earth, is right on the shores of the Potomac, and we discharge right out the back of the plant to the river. Now, that's done on purpose for obvious reasons, but that also makes us directly vulnerable, as we've seen in Florida, Texas, and other places, to when the storms hit. What we're doing here and trying to get ahead is a plan with 250 to 500-year flood potential. And people often hear a 100-year storm, a 500-year storm, and I'm not sure what that means. That's a probability statement. So a 100-year storm means, at least in past probabilities, a one in 100 chance of any given year that that storm of that size would happen. Obviously, one of the risks that have come to us with global warming and warming of the seas and of the atmosphere is that those storms are happening more often. So we are having 100-year storms a lot more often than 1 in 100, of the probability of 1 in 100, and a 500-year storm in 1 in 500. But we have been planning here, and Blue Plains, for example, we're building a retaining wall on the back end of the plant, which is where the storm surge would come, like you saw in Florida and Texas and Louisiana, and that would hit us at the back end of Blue Plains that would protect us from a 500-year flood and a storm surge so that we could keep this plant from being overrun and then having what's in it, which is all of what we're treating, flowing right out into the Potomac and the Chesapeake Bay. We're building our facilities now. We're trying to build up to a 250-year probability storm so that we can survive that storm, and even better if we can. Like I said, here we're doing 500-year flood planning. And then in parallel to that, because no matter what we build, a storm that is bigger than what we've planned for could come along and unfortunately will probably come along. A one in a thousand year storm will come. And at some level, it's going to be hard to build our way out of that. When you have 50 inches of rain, like they saw in Houston, it almost doesn't matter what you build with 50 inches of rain. There's almost no natural or built system that can handle that much rain in a short period of time. So then your question becomes, how do you as quickly and efficiently as possible get your systems up and running? Where do you have your backup systems? Do you have a place where all of your computer-based and system-based management can be moved to that's out of harm's way, maybe up in a higher elevation, somewhere set apart from where you are? And so we're planning on that as well. Not only what we do to protect ourselves when the storm comes, but how can we most efficiently and effectively get up and running after the storm recedes? And Florida had spent a lot of money trying to prepare for this in advance. But my gosh, uh, almost no matter what you do, something will come along that will eclipse what you've planned for. But it is certainly delivering the message that we cannot rest on our laurels. And more needs to be done, not less. And resilience after the storm is something that has to be prepared for as much or even more than what you do before the storm. Yes. Well, let me note that in one of your newsletters, by the way, the D.C. Water newsletter is the best I've ever seen in the country. And it's called What's on Tap, and we'll tell you how you can get access to it in a few minutes. But you mentioned that the D.C. Water may be the first water district in America who to get an emergency management accreditation program. Explain what that is, who actually accredits, and then tell us how is all this going to be funded? Is it all going to be by higher water rates for residents and businesses, or is there going to be federal infrastructure funds coming in? Let's start with the accreditation. Sure. I mean, D.C. Water has been working on every front. I guess in some respects we're good at emergency planning on a variety of fronts because we need to be. Washington, D.C. is obviously a target that if you have ill intent in this world and you wanted to make challenge for infrastructure, D.C. is one of the areas you would obviously focus on. So we have very extensive activities that we do with the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Energy, U.S. EPA, on planning and preparing for all kinds of threats, physical threats. All of our facilities are secure facilities. We have a very significant police force and cameras and Uh, all sorts of new programming that can assess what the cameras see. And the machines will notice if something is amiss from what they would expect. It still has to go to a person to verify. But using all sorts of techniques to have physical security at our facilities. Second is web-based security and, again, cyber threats. And have a huge program. Interestingly, the world is 
propelling forward, making more and more things electronically controlled, the Internet of Things, which makes things in some respects more efficient and easy. It also connects everything together and makes the risk of a cyber attack more broad. So one of the things we're uh, hacking and what we're doing here in part is making sure we have manual backup systems. So in a pinch, can we run this plant without all the sophisticated computer-based technologies in case we have to and be prepared on that basis? Let's project what our listeners might be asking right now. How do you get into the school systems to educate children right from the beginning, where the water comes from, how safe is it, what kind of information they can get immediately from the water district in their community. You've had neighborhood meetings. This outreach program has been pretty outstanding. We're talking with George Hawkins, who's the CEO of DC Water. Why don't you tell them that? And I'm sure some of them are thinking this, you know, I don't like what's in my public water system. I don't like fluorides. I don't like chlorine. I want bottled water. So also add your views on bottled water and whether it's adequately regulated. Let's start with your outreach to the neighborhoods and the schools. Sure. When I came into the job and prior to coming in as chief executive in 2009, I'd been on the board. I ran the Department of Environment for the city and regulated. We were known as DC WASA in those days. So I've actually been involved with the enterprise for 11 years. And when I came in, I was sort of staggered at the challenge we face, which is a challenge that every utility faces. And we have very old infrastructure in Washington, D.C. We have water mains in use in the city that were installed before the Civil War. The median age of a water main is 80 years old. This needs to be updated just to deliver a good service to the city. We also are always improving blue plains so that the discharge to the Potomac and the Chesapeake Bay is clean for the natural environment. There's always new contaminants on the drinking water side that you're looking at what treatment process you're going to deliver. So the needs of the enterprise are extraordinary. And our customer base was not aware or connected to what we did. In the old days, no one knew who we were. Or if they did, they didn't like us. So to me, doing customer outreach and identifying that we're not only a cost to you, because of course we are when you pay your bill, but we also have great jobs and we do work in your community and we're doing things that help deliver any business in Washington, D.C. has got to connect to us. So by doing our job well, we also support the economy in a fundamental way. But you're not going to know that unless we explain that to you. And when people say, well, I, people don't want to spend more for their water bill, my reaction is, of course they don't. If you ask me if you wanted me to pay more for my coffee or my shoes or anything, I'd say no, unless I know why. What's the value that I'm getting for this check that I'm writing for a bill that I received? That can't happen unless you have a relationship with the people you serve. And you're connecting not only in what you cost, but in the opportunities for jobs and benefits that your work delivers to the community. It's not just a cost, it's a benefit. And we had to build that from the ground up. I have to say it's been a fascinating and fun experience. I've done, got hundreds and hundreds of meetings of one sort or another. It was also to humanize DC water. There'll never be full agreement on what should or should not be done, but you can talk to a person and face to face. I do all the town halls myself. I've done them all. So if you want to have a question, you come up to me and ask me and we'll have a conversation. We hopefully will agree, but if we don't, we can at least have a very direct exchange of information and hopefully an understanding of what's being done and why. DCwater.com is the core. Almost everything we deliver is put up on our website. We have a very active Facebook page, a very active Twitter account. Can you give our listeners your website? DCwater.com. From there, you can get to our Facebook. And gosh, there's all sorts of social media that we do that our younger folks do that I'm not even totally familiar with that I need to be. We're willing and interested in communicating with our customers in any way that works. What's interesting, Mr. Nader, is that what we found is that the better that we get at communication, it requires a better level of performance. Because once people know who you are and you raise the expectations for what your organization can do, you've got to live up to those expectations. Very when you have a Twitter point. account yeah. and somebody tweets you that they see a problem at their corner where there's a water main break, they're expecting, I tweeted you, why haven't you responded? And our goal is to roll a truck within 30 minutes of getting that tweet. How about in the schools? In the schools, we do programs in schools almost by the week, and it's for a whole slew of reasons. We know that most adults learn about the environment through their children. 
So teaching a child has all sorts of benefits to all of our customers. All those children are going to grow up and be our customers. We're here forever. So we have a very long view as to who we need to speak with. And these kids may well, and in fact, will be the talent that comes into our organization or many of the contracted firms that work with us as well. So they're our workforce of the future. And at a minimum, we just need to have them know and understand. And it's amazing how interested kids are in water issues, it whether is. it's on the toilet side or the tap side. That's and, right. Um, it's been a great opportunity. And we get to their parents. And we have great pipeline of folks interested in coming to work for D.C. Water. And that's good all the way around. And you can have access to your educational materials on a website? Yes, we have a whole section of the website that's designed for kids and for our materials for schools. So Wonderful. there's a lot that we do. And one and of the questions that you asked was my he, view of bottled water. Also, um, just let me give you maybe sure. a little history. Before Mr. Hawkins came on, well before, there was a period of years without disclosure when people in parts of Washington, D.C. would turn on the faucet and there would be unacceptable levels of lead, lead contamination in the nation's capital. And so a lot of people rushed to their food stores and just started using bottled water, and some still do. So what's your view of bottled water? I think every option with water should be part of the mix. So there are times, not often, but there are times when I will buy bottled water. It's usually when there's no other option available and I forget my reusable bottle. And I'm going to be out in hot weather or something, and I don't know if a drinking fountain is available. But that's pretty rare, but it's still part of the mix. What I think is that you're right, for a variety of reasons, some of which were legitimate. People got scared away from their potable water coming out of the tap and to bottled water on the presumption that somehow bottled water is cleaner. What, Mr. Nader, what you and I know is that, in fact, bottled water is less regulated than the drinking water coming out of the tap. That doesn't mean it's cleaner or not cleaner. It just means you're not sure of that. And there's not any reason to guarantee it. So that getting bottled water doesn't by itself mean you're getting something that is safer for you. And if you add up all the other environmental consequence that comes with the mechanics it takes to extract that water from the ground, where it's been being taken from, when it's bottled with all that plastic and the production of plastic and all the petrochemicals that go into that, and then the delivery of all that bottled water all over the country in big trucks and all the pollutants that come from that, and then as it's cooled down in stores, just the sheer environmental balance of that bottled water is pretty extraordinary. And the less and the less public confidence people have in public drinking water systems, the more booming the private bottled water business is, which now is around fifteen billion with a B dollar year and it's clogging the streets, as just Mr. Hawkins been saying. And so that's why it's extremely important to restore confidence in the public drinking water system. And so under the Drinking Water Act of 1974, what can an average citizen all over the country demand immediately in terms of periodic reports from their local drinking water system? Sure. We are required by that law to deliver a very detailed report about the quality of the water in here. And that's true of every public water provider, uh, actually any water provider, public or private, in the United States. How often? So we deliver all, we make it permanent. So anytime you go on dcwater.com, you can see the information. So in essence, that's available to you anytime you'd like to see it. We deliver it in electronic form and as part of a connection to the bill at least once a year is my memory. And we may do it more than that. I, I'm sorry to say that I don't remember exactly because it, it, to my view, we need to provide that at any time whenever asked. So I, I'm a little hazy on what the legal requirement is because to me that's a floor that we have to exceed by far. But anyone who's listening to the podcast should know that in your community there will be one of these consumer confidence reports that you have access to. And if you don't, call your water utility and ask for it. They need to have it on hand. They need to be ready to provide it to you. And for us, it's something 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We want you to be able to access that report, see what the quality of the water is. And what I say to every audience I speak to is that we're confident of the water out in the main in the street. The challenge that we have, although we believe the water is clean coming out of your spigot, is that we do not know for sure what happens to that water when it goes through the line that connects the main into your house or the building that your kids are going to school or what the plumbing in the house may be. And there might be contaminants that come in that aren't really part of our public system. But we still feel that the water coming out of that spigot needs to be clean. So in every audience I talk to, one of the things we do at DC Water is, is upon request, 
at any time, if you have an issue or are worried about the quality of the water that's actually coming out of the tap, so now what's out that we test out in the main, but what's coming out of the tap in your bathroom or your kitchen, we'll send you a kit. We'll tell you how to use it. It's for free on request. We'll take it back. We'll analyze it. And we'll tell you the quality of the water coming out of your faucet because we want you to know that. And if there's a problem, some of it we can solve if it's on the public side. Some of it you may need to solve if it's in your house or in your business, but we'll help you solve it because we want you to have confidence of the water coming from the faucet. And that is automatically going to mean a partnership between us and you because there's part of that system that's not ours. It's yours. And well, listeners, now you can, ask, you can ask your own public water district if they supply that kind of service as well, whether they will take a sample from your faucet and test it and get back to you about what's actually coming out of your faucet, which may not be what is in the main, the large mains that feed into your home or to your apartment building. What about these private corporations that want to go around looking like at Atlanta and elsewhere and say, oh, you're under-investing, you don't, you don't have enough money to bring your facilities up to date, we'll buy the entire water system and privatize it. What's your view of that? Well, I, ultimately, in any of the, and I've, and I've seen these business models, I haven't seen that in the many places where that's actually happened, but what Everyone who's listening needs to understand that the core of any of these models is there has to be a rate payer paying in money to the system. So if a private company is going to come in and run the water system, they're only going to do that if they have in their sense a – remember, that's a shareholder-owned enterprise. It has to deliver to their shareholders a value proposition. So the question to that company is, how are we going to run this city's system in a way that can generate enough revenue – to pay our costs and generate a profit to our shareholders. That's a private sector business model. And at the core of that is a rate payer. Someone has to write out the check that's going to go to the enterprise that's going to run the system. So there's nothing for free in this world. Anyone who comes in and says, we're going to come in and invest lots of private money to make it work. There are times when I've seen that work. If there's a reason that a municipal government has a challenge in expanding their debt portfolio, and they can't issue bonds for whatever reason. It may be that having private money foot the bill and then paid back over time from rates is the option that works because that municipality can't access debt markets. We can do that. For example, we're at AAA credit, so we just go straight to markets ourselves. We we essentially get private money in the form of people investing in our bonds, but we don't need to go to a private company for that. There may be places where that makes sense, But ultimately, whenever there's that description, there's always the question of, well, if that company is going in, how are they going to make enough money to pay all their costs and generate a profit when the core person writing the check is always going to be the same? It's always coming back to the cost to the rate payer. And that's what's caused some of the failures is these private corporate takeovers of public drinking water systems. And they raised the rates. There was a huge uproar. And in some cases, they've pulled back, they've thrown in the towel. This is a civic responsibility, I think. This is something that is inherently a public government service. And people will get what they pay for if they're vigilant and they use the system and the information to protect their families and make sure that modern transmission systems are kept up to date and ones that are built before the Civil War (laughs) would need to be replaced. You know, we're looking at uh, Congress. The Senate has just taken Donald Trump's request to add $54 billion to the defense budget and taken it up to $80 billion. The defense budget has been condemned by many retired generals, admirals, and GAO reports is bloated and redundant and full of waste in the contracting systems, etc. We've been talking with George Hawkins, the CEO of DC Water, and he's come up with a his team and he have come up with a very important idea that you can replicate across the country, listeners. So you and your colleagues have started a nonprofit group called Blue Drop, which I want you to describe. But most interesting, you sort of took the cue for that from the very successful Friends of the National Zoo here in Washington, D.C., a group whose guided tours, parking spaces, and stuffed animals keep the beloved zoo well-funded to the tune of several million dollars a year. So how is this nonprofit Blue Drop organization going to work? 
Great question. To me, and this is it's odd for the public sector, but in my view, there's no reason it should be. D.C. water, like I said, there's plenty of ways that we need to get better, but there are a lot of things that we're quite good at. And the only reason we're good at it is because our ratepayers have invested in us. Almost everything we've done has been ratepayer funded. So if we're good at communications or we're good at biosolids management or we're good at how we treat water and, and respond to our customers, we have learned that skill through the investment made in us by our ratepayers. And we learned a lot of it. We learned a lot of it by making mistakes. Now, there's a lot of other utilities that can learn from our experience. And that what I felt was we set up Blue Drop. It's an independent nonprofit affiliate like lots of good organizations have. And it's designed to take things that we've learned, offer that knowledge to other public utilities just like us. And we don't just offer the idea. We offer the idea from a group that has implemented it. We've lived it day to day out in the street where we deliver our services at a good price. But it's a price designed to me a good cost for the utility that we're helping getting one of their compatriots to show them sort of if they're starting a football game, they're not starting on yard one, 99 yards to go. They're starting on the 50 yard line way in because we can get them that far. They still have to do the next 50 yards themselves. But we can put you a long way forward by what we've learned already. And any revenue that Blue Drop makes that it exceeds the costs of delivering that service returns to DC Water to support all the work we have to do and take pressure off ratepayers. So one city is getting a low cost assistance from another utility. The, and we're getting support back to our ratepayers. In my view, if we help another city and they get good at something, they should turn around and help someone else charge enough money to get to reimburse their ratepayers for the skill that they earned and enough to pay them back a bit. And then it just is a virtuous circle of utilities helping other utilities to show the way. And that's what Blue Drop is for. We can help improve on that failed business model. And George Hawkins is leaving his career post at the end of the year. He's going to be writing a book about water facilities around the country and probably around the world, and he's also going to stay in close touch with Blue Drop. In conclusion, Mr. Hawkins, what would you suggest to our listeners? Give them as many websites, but what would you suggest that they do in their local area in terms of taking precautions and boning up on what's going on? Sure. What I'd suggest, I mean, there's there's so many good websites. The Water Environment Federation and the American Water Works Association are the two trade associations. And through them, you can find out who your water utility is. Although my bet is if you just put in Google your town and in water or wastewater, it'll pop up the name of your institutions. And they're good people who work in these places. Often they need some help on communicating with customers because most of the people who work in this field are on the science and engineering side, and they're, they're focused on the work at hand as opposed to communicating with people. That's not because they're not good people. That's just not what they were hired for. They were hired to actually run the treatment plants. But they do have a lot of information. The more you communicate with your utility, even if some of your communication is being mad at them, and I get plenty of communication to this day at DC Water where a customer is frustrated by something we've done, it makes us better. The more we open ourselves up to that kind of feedback, even if sometimes it's painful to hear, it makes us a better enterprise. So I always favor you connecting with your water utility. They're good people. They're your neighbors, and they're doing something that really matters to you. And almost no matter what your communication is, I hope you're constructive and thoughtful, even if you've got some frustrations, is that you'll make them better. And when they're better, you'll be better. And it's a virtuous cycle. So take a look in your community where they are. DCWater.com is a good place to look. As I said, the two big trade associations for our industry, one is the Water Environment Federation and the other is the American Water Works Association. One is on the, I call it enriched water, but the wastewater side, and the other is on the drinking water side. And if you put WEF.org or AWWA.org, you'll get their websites and, and have a vast array of resources to start you off to connect with your local utility. They're your neighbors. Uh, I encourage you to do it. And you send what's on tap in the mail, actually, a print edition for anybody who wants it, right? Absolutely. And, uh, yep, it goes to every one of our customers every month, and we make it electronically available, and we'll send it to anybody who asks. So you can contact us. We love to talk about what we do. We love our work. I am stepping down, but most of the reason I'm stepping down is to try to figure out how I can deliver more service to other. DC Water is great. They've got great people. They will do just fine about me at the helm. The question is, how can I be of service in other ways? And so I look forward to doing in the days ahead. Well, there you are, listeners. That's an example of what public servants should be all about. George Hawkins, 
CEO of DC Water. Well, thank you, Mr. Hawkins. When your uh, book is out, we'll want you on again. And good luck to your growing impact nationwide from your sterling experience here in the District of Columbia. Thank you, George Hawkins. Thank you. We've been speaking with George Hawkins, Chief Executive Officer and General Manager of DC Water, an innovative and environmentally friendly water utility. We will link to DC Water at the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website. That's www.ralphnaderradiohour.com. You're listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Now let's take a short break and check in with corporate crime reporter Russell Mokhyber. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Friday, September 22, 2017. I'm Russell Mokhyber. Lenovo will pay $3.5 million and make changes in how it sells laptops in order to settle allegations it sold devices with preloaded software that compromised users' security protections. The software, called Visual Discovery, was installed on hundreds of thousands of laptops in order to deliver pop-up advertisements. The software was also able to access consumers' sensitive information like social security numbers. That's according to the Federal Trade Commission. The FTC said that as part of the settlement, Lenovo agreed to get consumers' consent before installing this type of software. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. You're listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. If you're listening to the show as a podcast and would like to listen to it as a broadcast, please contact your local radio station and say, I want the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Douglas Rushkoff is a prolific writer, documentarian, and lecturer whose work focuses on human autonomy in the digital age. He is the author of 15 best-selling books on media, technology, and society, including Program or Be Programmed, Present Shock and Coercion, Why We Listen to What They Say. He has made such award-winning PBS frontline documentaries as Generation Like, Merchants of Cool, and The Persuaders, and is the author of the graphic novels Testament and Alistair and Adolf. He also hosts his own podcast called Team Human, and his latest book is entitled Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, How Growth Became the Enemy of Prosperity. I think Ralph Nader has met his match. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Douglas Rushkoff. Thanks for having me. Welcome indeed, Douglas Rushkoff. You are a rare combination of a consultant to business with an independent mind. So you know what the story is inside these market manipulators, and you also come at it from a consumer perspective on how to fight back here. One of the comments on one of your earlier books called Coercion, Why We Listen to What They Say, says this, quote, marketing continues to grow more aggressive and Rushkoff tracks the increasingly coercive techniques it employs to ingrain its message in the minds of consumers as well as the results. Toddlers can recognize the golden arches of McDonald's, Young rebels get tattooed with a Nike swoosh, and news stories are increasingly taken verbatim from company press releases. That's the quote of the comment. And then they quote you as saying, corporations and consumers are in a coercive arms race. Every effort we make to regain authority over our actions is met by an even greater effort to usurp it, end quote. And the commentary by the reviewer says, As you survey the visual, aural, and scented shopping environment and interview salesmen, public relations men, telemarketers, ad men, and consumers, Rushkoff, who admits to being one of them in his occasional capacity as paid corporate consultant, concludes that they are just us, and the only way the process of coercion can be reversed is to refuse to comply. Without us, he assures, they don't exist. That was written in 2000. 17 years later, with massive fine print contracts being clicked on without even being read, trapping consumers, and with ever more manipulative shaping of what consumers are purported to want to seek or to be trapped in a credit debit economy, what's your view of whether consumers can really refuse to comply? How do you refuse to sign fine print contracts from various competitors who don't compete over the contract? How do you refuse to 
give someone your credit card in a hotel or rental car agency and you want to pay cash, how do you refuse the intrusions of privacy and the most personal aspects of your life that Facebook and Equifax and others have combined? <laughs> well, in certain ways, you know, participation kind of negates refusal. You know, at the time in the late 90s, what I was most concerned about was sort of what the automated styles of coercion that I saw being worked on. You know, it's come to fruition today in the way that, say, Facebook uses the data it has about our past in order to market to us a future that we don't yet know we're going to live, but they do. You know, they know with 80% accuracy if we're going to get divorced or get sick or change gender identity or go on a diet before we do. And then they market to us not just in order to sell us their customers' diet plan, but in order to increase the odds that we actually do what we've been predicted to do. You know, when they start filling your news feed with, hey, you know, you're feeling fat today or what are you really eating or want to try something else, what they're trying to do is to increase that percentage to get you from an 80% likelihood of going on a diet to a 90 or to a 100. It's really to reduce human spontaneity. And that's the thing that I was getting concerned about was watching these already kind of dastardly Vance Packard era hidden persuader psychological techniques and looking at what happens when they move into the interactive space. And in many ways, it's gotten worse than I would have imagined because I assumed that consumers would just get nauseous of this. They would get tired of it. And if they were being abused to this extent, that they would just log off. But instead, you know, we're taking the smartest kids out of Stanford and teaching them what's called captology in the labs of BJ Fogg, you know, how to elicit these Pavlovian responses to every bell and swipe and text and button on our smartphones so that every swipe we make on our smartphone, it gets smarter about us as we get dumber about it. So the overall, the, the biggest answer to your question, I guess, would be that we can't even really think of ourselves as consumers anymore. That once you put yourself in the role of the consumer, you're kind of lost. That we have to retake our roles as producers and participants and citizens rather than thinking of ourselves as the customers of these companies because we're not. We're just the resources of these companies. Yeah, as a matter of fact, corporations have leapfrogged the market and they put a lot of influence on government to get their way not just subsidies, but reducing regulation. I mean, Equifax has reported it in the papers after having admitted that 140 million and counting of their customer accounts may have been hacked. They were up on Capitol Hill trying to get the Congress to limit the amount of damages they have to pay in lawsuits and to further deregulate them. So they're working the government arena, not just as vendors, but as a lobbyist. But I've watched over the years, Mr. Ruskoff, the incredible number of traps. It isn't just the psychological seduction of these advertisements, the way Vance Packard talked about it in his book many years ago, The Hidden Persuaders. It's a much more concrete trap. For example, Amazon traps you. I have progressive colleagues who hate what Amazon stands for, that it's emptying out Main Street. It's shutting down small business. It's invading privacy. It's escaping taxes. And yet they shop Amazon. Why? Well, we've paid the 90 some dollars for free shipping and it's reliable. And I don't want to go down to the local Best Buys. So increasingly they're selling monopolistic convenience and they're trapping you. I mean, you see, for the first time in economic history, the vendors don't have to persuade you as a consumer to give them their money. They just debit you. They've got your credit card. That's another coercion. I might say, listeners, that Professor Ruskoff is one of the few academics working the corporate marketplace that uses the word coercion, but that's what it is. So how do you, other than joining a consumer cooperative, other than setting up sub-economies of cooperatives, so there's a network of services all the way from car selling to banking to insurance to adult education classes in a kind of cooperative sub-economy insulated from these corporations, 
They've even made it difficult, the banks, of switching banks. In the old days, you close down the account, you go to another bank. Now they got you so entangled that you just say, oh, forget it. I'll have to stick with Bank of America. Yeah. I mean, what technologists do is program for what they call defensible outcomes. And that means to get you to be a customer, but so enmeshed that it will cost you more to get out than you would save by getting out. So if you run your software company on Amazon cloud services, you know, good luck detangling from that <laughs> you know, and going to someone else. It's done. These are a permanent lifelong decisions. And, you know, the thing I did in the latest book in this Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus book was really looked at why would developers be like this? Why do they want to have such, frankly, evil companies that really don't serve? You know, when an Uber goes into a taxi market, they're not trying to help people get to places better. They just are looking for the low-hanging fruit of an inefficient marketplace, and they're going to extract all the value of it and use their war chest of venture capital to lobby, as you would say, you know, to lobby laws to promote their monopolies, the same as Amazon going to books. But when you talk to the developers, they don't understand that there's another way. I mean, there's this one moment where it all became clear to me is when I saw a friend of mine, Evan Williams, one of the founders of Twitter, he was on the cover of the Wall Street Journal with the number $4.3 billion under his photo, which was the amount of money he made when that company had its IPO. And I thought, this guy is screwed. If you've got $4.3 billion on the day of your IPO and your investors are expecting you to make 100x, 100 times returns, then you're going to have to destroy your company or destroy everybody that uses it. You're going to have to adopt these you know, rapacious monopolistic strategies and you only establish a monopoly in order to leverage that monopoly and then go take over another one. So the minute that you interact with any of these companies as a writer, you know, I wrote the one book that you were talking about, Programmer Be Programmed. I wanted to say something really, you know, important in this book about, you know, taking charge of your digital life and realizing that if you are not in charge, if you are not programming your own digital life, and I don't mean necessarily with code, but in the way you use these things, then you are the stooge, then you are being programmed by it. And I did that book with a very independent publisher who did not sell on Amazon. Because if you sell on Amazon, you've got to sell at a 60% discount and you can't undercut them. There's all of these rules that make it really, really hard to make money if you're not on Amazon or if you are on Amazon, but impossible to distribute your book if you're not. If I go on your show or on NPR and talk about a book, everybody goes to Amazon to see it. Yet this book with an independent publisher, I ended up selling more copies of that than most of my other books and at a much higher margin because we weren't paying 60% and we could sell it cheaper and sell it as a paperback. So what I would argue is that you can go around the system. You know, you don't have to use Uber. You could use Lyft. You don't have to use Lyft. You could use a local cab company. I mean, most of them have little apps now because they've caught up. You can operate outside that system. And I agree. Uh, Platform cooperatives are a terrific alternative to the platform monopolies that are being set up by these companies. These are worker-owned companies. Or a notion that I kind of borrowed from the Catholic popes of the early part of the 20th century, where they were arguing for something they called distributism, which means that the workers need to own the means of production, whether that in their time, it was the little tools that they used to be plumbers or carpenters, or today, whether they're co-owners in the platform that they're building. Because if they're owners of the platform, then all of a sudden the priorities change. They're no longer growth-obsessed corporate monoliths, which is the real problem here. It's the growth imperative in the economy. And instead, they start to think about how can we optimize for the velocity of money? How can we optimize for transactions? How can we operate more like a family business? It's looking at how do we create a sustainable business that enriches the marketplace on which it depends rather than a short-term business that balloons by destroying the marketplace from which it's extracting value? But you see, we're talking with Douglas Rushkoff, who is the author of his latest book, Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, How Growth Became the Enemy of Prosperity. And before I ask you why readers should read this book, which is a generic question we authors always like to be asked. Let me just say that 
no matter what the response is by consumers, the corporations are tightening the noose. They are strangling the consumer. I'll give you an example. I'm a consumer. I do not have a credit card. I do not have a debit card. I pay only in cash. So therefore, I have no credit history. So therefore, if they require a credit history for you to do business with them, I would be out of luck. Increasingly, for example, homeowner insurance companies are saying, well, what's your Equifax ratio? What's your credit score? And if you say, well, I don't have a credit score because I pay cash. Well, too bad. We can't do business with you. So in recent years, the nooses, the corporate nooses are tightening on the consumer surfs. And it's really getting overwhelming. And even critics like you are having trouble keeping up with what is in fine print contracts. For example, we are now signing contracts with all kinds of banks and as consumers, all airlines, etc., credit card companies, they're sticking in a provision called unilateral modification. This is even worse than compulsory arbitration, which keeps you from going to court and getting your right of trial by jury. The unilateral modification, which is in some page 18, I mean, the Airbnb contract with owners of homes who want to rent out is about 70 pages. And the unilateral modification means that the seller with whom you are dealing, consumer, can change the contract in any way, in any time, and you're bound by it because you signed that contract. You clicked on. So you see how it's evolving. And I don't know whether our side and the best thinkers on our side are keeping up here. Right. Well, I mean, I'm trying to. I'll tell you, the nightmare scenario of the uh, user agreement uh, flexibility that companies want is as we move into medical devices. So you install a new pacemaker or some kind of a hearing aid or something really deep in your body, and then you find out the user agreement lets them change the way that thing works, or your relationship with that company changes, or your subscription's not being paid, and all of a sudden, you really are tied to that in a way that <laughs> it's much worse than losing your Pandora music subscription <laughs> or you know finding out that they've been listening in on your phone calls. Or they so, can turn off your car when you're on the highway because you missed the installment loan payment date. Right. It gives such that a- happened to me. That my car I don't mean to interrupt, but that happened to me. I'm sorry, I'll talk about that later. Yeah. But I mean the problem with the way that we're currently developing technology is that we're not looking at how can we make technologies that make people's lives better or more convenient or that helps them create value as people. Technologies that we are building understand human beings purely as consumers and not even traditional consumers that need the good or service, but consumers are just collections of data that we can mine in order to sell. That's what you are. You're no longer paying with your money. You don't have money. Consumers don't have money. The middle class is gone. All they've got left to pay with is their data. And that's a really difficult position to be in. So we develop new kinds of technologies that are really just new ways of collecting rent by learning more and more about who we are and then using that information to reduce our spontaneity, to thwart our cognitive abilities. So the only real response, and I, I hate to say it, is to drop out to a large extent. It doesn't mean dropping out of technology, but it means not subscribing to all of these platforms. It means becoming aware of what are called the externalities of every technology purchase and um, use you make. It's to look at that smartphone and realize that the rare earth metals in that smartphone required little kids to go into caves in the Congo at gunpoint to get those minerals. So people always ask me, oh, what's the most environmentally friendly phone I can get next? It's like your best next smartphone is the smartphone you already have and not to get another one. But it's very hard for people to kind of to, to wrap their heads around this. And an important point to make is that, you know, it's not necessarily the fault of the kids who are working at Google and Facebook and everywhere else, even some of the people who are running it. They just come up with a technology idea. They go to Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley and they ask for money. And then all of a sudden they're on a certain kind of a hamster wheel that's requiring them to grow in order to survive. So the answer is 
and this is what I'm trying to do now, this is what throwing rocks at the Google bus is really about, is speaking not just to the public, but to developers saying, there's another way. How about instead of having a one out of a million chance of becoming a billionaire, how about a one out of a hundred chance of becoming a millionaire? Isn't just having some millions enough? Then you could have a sustainable company. Then you could look about at how can you make your market wealthy rather than poor? How can you run your company like a family business? How can you start moving towards a steady state economy with dividends and payouts rather than a growth-based economy that's always about capital and selling it? How Did you know there's a company that agrees with you, Patagonia? Yvonne Chouinard, yes. the founder and CEO of Patagonia that produces uh, outdoor clothing and is very successful. Uh, I know. And they're one of the few examples I get to bring up, you know, when I'm doing a talk for these people. But the thing that you have to realize, and I haven't said this publicly before, but, you know, I went, I, I got invited out to a, a dinner with these super wealthy CEOs. I mean, a couple of them were like billionaire people. And the conversation eventually turned to their bomb shelters, to their apocalypse survival scenarios. Like one of them wanted to know, how do I maintain the uh, allegiance of my security force after money's not worth anything? Or where should I be buying land for climate change in Anchorage, Alaska, or down in New Zealand? First, as if I really know the answers to these questions. But the thing I keep telling them is, look, rather than trying to figure out how are you going to make enough money to insulate yourself from this horrible world, what about spending your effort making the world into a place where you you don't feel the need to insulate yourself from it, then you won't need to be earning 10,000 times your average employee. You won't need billions of dollars. It used to be really okay just to have millions or even just hundreds of thousands and you could get by, you know, but it doesn't work if you really see the world as this thing to rise above rather than this community to join. Well, this is what your book is about. Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus by Douglas Rushkoff. Two questions. Has Google uh, reacted to your relatively pejorative implication from the title of your book? And why should people read your book? I loved your example of Pacific Lumber and Redwoods. Mm. Google didn't respond to the book directly, but Google does respond whenever I have a piece in a place like Fast Company or CNN that challenges Google or Amazon on the basis of monopolization, that I suggest that they're a monopoly or that they should be regulated in some way. I always get a really friendly call from one of these lobbyists with a 202 Washington DC number, just wanting to talk to me about my opinion and trying to help me, really trying to convince me in the merits of traditional corporate capitalism. They really don't understand capitalism. They haven't read their marks. They don't understand what capital does or its extractive nature. You know, they really want a company to be able to make money simply by having money. You know, the other critique I got from some people at Google was in the book, I explain how um, these people don't really, they're not looking forward to a human-based civilization. That the chief scientist at Google, a guy named Ray Kurzweil, believes in this thing called the singularity, where human beings will be bested and then replaced by computer technology. So human beings will only be necessary insofar as we keep the machines running and we upload what's left of consciousness to these chips. So if you have that understanding of humanity, then why would you care about consumers? Why would you care about the middle class? You can't because you really think, well, climate change is coming. we are got to get to Mars. A computer chip's going to do it better than we are. So let's just move towards that inevitability. And I, as a human being, I'm not willing to go there. So that's well, in large part what this book is arguing, that we are building our technology at the expense of humans. I'm not one of those guys who's all afraid of AI, you know, artificial intelligence and robots taking over. These companies are great salespeople and they completely overstate you know, what they can do in the next few centuries of technological progress. But I am really concerned that the growth of these kinds of corporate behemoths, which now not only only operate on the economy, but form the landscape of the economy. You know, Google isn't just an advertising company. It's also our leading information 
company. They are the economy. These are the landscapes on which human interaction, on which the economy is taking place. So instead of just using laws the way our 13th or 14th century corporate charter forebears, you know, the British East India Trading Company was able to dominate and create monopoly through law, companies like Amazon and Google and Facebook can do it through code. And when you do it through code, it's much more pernicious, it's much more invisible, and it's much harder for even a democratic body politic uh, to influence. Well, we're going to have to have another program. We're just getting started. But (laughs) as I hear you, what you're saying in part is that we are being inundated by technological hype and technological straitjackets, and we haven't developed ethical and legal frameworks for technology assessment as befits a democratic society and a sovereign people. So right. I think I think that's what uh, and all kinds of boundaries are being crossed. Jeff Bezos, who founded and runs Amazon, the richest man in the world, depending on what date you pick. Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post personally, and he has a huge mega multi-million dollar contract with the CIA for cloud computing services. I mean, these are boundaries which only a decade or two ago would be considered verbatim, would be considered unheard of. So we're just getting started, Douglas Rushkoff. Your students ought to be happy that they have a far-seeing professor to teach them. The book is Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, How Growth Became the Enemy of Prosperity. And we're going to have another program on this. Thank you very much, Douglas Rushkoff. How can people reach you? Just go to uh, rushkoff.com, that's my website, or go to teamhuman.fm and listen to more of my ranting and uh, interviews with people who are trying to reinstate human autonomy in this increasingly digitally controlled era. The book is Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, The Accumulated Wisdom of Douglas Rushkoff, who's been on the inside of the business world and the outside as a leading critic for relating democratic principles to modern technology. Thank you, Professor Rushkoff. Oh, thank you. Thanks for what you do. We've been speaking with Douglas Rushkoff, author of Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, How Growth Became the Enemy of Prosperity. He also hosts the podcast Team Human, and we will link all of that over at the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website. I want to thank our guests again today, George Hawkins. He's the head of the innovative water utility DC Water and Douglas Rushkoff, author of Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, How Growth Became the Enemy of Prosperity. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap Up. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour when we speak with Morris Pearl, chairman of a group called Patriotic Millionaires. Thank you, Ralph. And thank you all. We just had a very successful event with Phil Donahue at the Tort Museum on Constitution Day, September 17th. Go to tortmuseum.org and consider visiting it. Hey, this is Jimmy Lee Wirt, producer of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Welcome to the wrap-up, where Ralph continues his discussion with Douglas Rushkoff, and he asks another important question of D.C. Waters' George Hawkins. Now, what's it going to take nationwide? Uh, We're talking with George Hawkins, the exemplary CEO of D.C. Water here in the District of Columbia. What's it going to take in terms of overall investment needs? The Society of Civil Engineers, you know, surveys how much we have to invest to bring up to par our schools, our water systems. What's the deferred maintenance cost now for water systems all over the country, if you have an estimate? The estimate runs to the hundreds of billions up to trillions of dollars, depending on the time frame that you measure the number. It's enormous. And I think the challenge we have in the water sector is that most of our systems were built between 50 and 100 years ago. A lot of the suburban systems were built when the suburbs were really expanding right after World War II. And customers and our forebears in that era paid capital costs for these systems. But then when you put in a pipe, it does, in fact, last a pretty long time. That's why we have pipes in place that are working just fine, that are more than 100 years old. But they are beginning to fall apart. That's what the American Society of Civil Engineers has been pointing out. 
But our customer base has been used to paying operating costs. If you put in, it's like your roof. When I buy the house, I don't think of, do I have the money I put aside to replace the roof? Because roofs last a long time. It may not be in the front of my mind to put a money aside every year so that when the roof does go, I've got that big chunk of money at the ready. That's very hard to do in the public sector. And the challenge we have now is that we don't just have operating costs to run these systems. We have capital costs that are needed to upgrade old infrastructure that needs to be improved, not only to deliver core services, but to remove contaminants and new contaminants and pharmaceuticals and microbeads and all sorts of things we need to now treat that we weren't designed to treat back when these systems were built 20, 30, 50, 100 years ago. And that you cannot so I, I, put on the ratepayer. That's got to be a capital investment probably with basic public tax revenues hearkening back to President Trump's promise to have a huge infrastructure program. Isn't that correct? I mean, originally in the 1970s, when basic treatment was done across the country, that was a large construction grants program because a decision was made that when I grew up in Cleveland, I, I actually visited the Cuyahoga River in 1969, which is when it ignited on fire and burned for a week. So I remember that. And we as a society decided that this shall not stand. We need to do better. And as a society, through the public effort of tax revenue that has been deployed, we built treatment facilities all over the country like Blue Plains. And we face a similar challenge today. I personally believe it ought to be a combination of local ratepayers and federal support, because I always think that having a local skin in the game, make sure you're as efficient, as effective as you can be. Because sure. if it's my own money that's on the table, I'm really careful with it. And that we all need to be careful with the funds that come to us. But having a national tax base, what better investment can this country make in its future for every single job, for every single life form, for incredible job opportunities that then repay the community in every way than its water system? And now Ralph talks to Douglas Rushkoff about the reinstatement of the Office of Technology Assessment. And reinstatement brings to mind the need to reinstate the Office of Technology Assessment, OTA, in Congress, which, uh, yeah. which you Newt think? Gingrich abolished in 1994. I know. I was just watching the Reagan, the Reagan years on the CNN, that documentary. And I was like, oh, my God, I remember that. It's amazing, though. It's the same. I mean, it started with the Corvair. I remember my mom yelling at my dad because you had said that <laughs> Corvair was no good and she made him sell it. But we still <laughs> never implemented what you were arguing for. I mean, on a case by case basis. It's worked, but systemically, we still haven't really addressed this issue from an appropriate vantage point. We have not civically kept up with the corporate marauders and their innovative straitjackets on the people of this world. Yeah, yeah, and we've ended up, unfortunately, sacrificing a very promising set of technologies to the worst forces on the planet. Indeed. Thank goodness for solar energy and the reduction in the price of solar panels. Otherwise, mm -hmm we'd still be stuck with fossil fuels and nuclear power. There is hope. Hope has to be connected to action, and our listeners are ripe for that kind of recommendation. 